Ah, yes, friends, on a Friday, it's OGP, the one giant podcast, as you know, coming at you with myself, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andy Makowitz, who's healthy, wealthy, and wise, and behind enemy lines, deep in Boston, looking to represent the New York fan base. Ah, yes, Adam, going to be my first time at Fenway Park. Um, you'd think being a, a Yankee and Giant fan, I would have experienced a Fenway and Yaki way at some point in my life. But yes, I'll be I'll be behind enemy lines at the Red Sox home opener this afternoon. Hey, man, somebody's got to get out there, got to uh, absorb the beautiful sunshine. What we think is permanently warmer weather now as we work our way through April, but only time will tell. We come in, as we know. Breaking down position by position, the New York football Giants heading towards the draft and trying to identify where are the spots here in the draft with the multiple first round picks, high, second, third, multiple mid rounders. Where are the Giants going to go to improve this team? I, I said it on Twitter just quickly yesterday. I was like, the more that I look at the Giants is the more holes that I see. Like every time that I go back to this deal, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're probably going to want to get something there. Well, you'd sure like to have a third round pick to fill a need at that spot. So as you know, we've gone through wide receiver, we've gone through linebacker, we've gone through safety, and today is going to be a double dip because these feel like two, again, no less needed in terms of potential holes on the roster, but also something that is going to be difficult, I think, for the Giants to get after too early, Andy, first of which is going to be that sweet, sweet tight end room. Well, listen, Adam, it's it's funny that you say that because I I keep thinking the same thing. I'm uh, you know, for each of the positions when we do our our scouting, we go to, you know, five or six different, you know, draft profile websites, see who they have listed, find out what's consistent. What I keep finding myself doing for different positions, I'm like, "Oh, we have so many needs. I got to scroll to like page 2 or page 3 because <laughs> we're not going to be able to get one of these top 3 guys at the position cuz it's going to be too rich for the Giants to to be able to do that." Like Obviously, we talked about offensive line and, and those needs. We've profiled safety. We've profiled linebacker. We, you know, we, we've we now moved over to a position that is near and dear to your heart. I know that you are very, very sad about pro bowler Evan Ingram moving on. You know, you, you, were, you thought the heartfelt letter that he wrote to all Giant fans saying goodbye was specifically to you. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and to replace him, it just – Ricky Seals Jones comes in. I know he'll be one tenth of your heart that you have towards Evan Ingram. But how are you feeling overall about the tight end room right now for the Giants? Yeah, listen, it's I mean, you know, Evan Ingram piece aside, it just it had to happen. Obviously, he's from the previous regime. You know that he's never lived up to the billing, and you can't go into a year again with this weird expectation around a player of well, if he can do what we always thought he could, then he could be something. Uh, so it made all the sense in the world with the turnover from the coaching staff and obviously the GM. Um, you know, listen, Ricky, Ricky Seals Jones, I think is a quality veteran to bring in to set a baseline. Everybody else you think about in that room too, by the way, right. Moving off of the money that you had locked up in there, uh, rice and John, he's, he's a sneaky little fellow My guy. The practice squad potentially, but essentially what you have is, is, is a barren room. You have a blank slate here. Ricky Seals Jones is not going to be a blocking tight end for this team. Certainly he gives you some reliability as a, as a pass catcher, former wide receiver turned tight end out of college. So I, there's work to do. And to your, to your point though, when we, when we talk about the needs in the draft, it's hard to say anything sooner. I mean, I, I, you know, 67 is still too early for me. You had to go 81 and beyond to really feel like, okay, we've addressed other key areas of need. And now, if the right prospect is there that either offers us significant athleticism as a receiver, as a pass catcher, and we haven't maybe gotten a receiver yet to that point, then I could see them going there. Or that overall value of being a pass blocker, being able to be in line along the offense there, and then still be reliable enough with some good hands to catch some short and intermediate passes. But it's a tough spot because once you get there, now you start to try to flesh out where is the right wheelhouse to grab one of these guys. Yeah, I mean, that's what I kind of alluded to at the top of the show is that you think about what the Giants need in the first round and the second round. To me, tight end falls so far down the list. We also know that in Brian Dable's system, he rarely, if ever, uses two tight end sets. So it's not like it's it's an area where you really think that you're going to need that extra personnel. Don't need the three, four deep, you know, roster like we've talked about, like we've seen so much of with the Giants, right? Piling up these players and then going, well, maybe situationally, this is kind of like 
we need one that can do things we need and then a respectable like Ricky Seals Jones veteran to be there as well. Or you need a yin and a yang complementary tight ends that accomplish different things for you, whether it's pass That's leading, you're leading the witness. You're trying to set up the table here. I see what's happening. I, I'm just saying situationally, you might need to, you know, a, a, a different tight end that gives you a different look. And, sure. and Adam, I think the easiest way to explain this to giant fans is, um, is when you think about Wink Martindale's defensive scheme, we talked about it in our safety preview. Wink Martindale loves playing cover one, which means one safety on the field. It means that you know the depth of your safety room doesn't have to necessarily have it. You kind of can be a little bit more top-heavy with someone like Xavier McKinney and not worry about it too much. I feel the same way about the tight end room um, with Brian Dable, where he doesn't run two tight end sets. You know, while Dawson Knox was there in Buffalo, he wasn't like a be all end all. They, you know, clearly went out and got Stefan Diggs for a reason because they wanted a nice, you know, polished route runner on the outside. Sure. And so for the Giants, I, I just don't think the first and second round there, there's enough positional need in terms of of the scheme that Dayball runs. And so that's when we start looking in the third, fourth, fifth, and beyond for for one of these one of these different you know tight ends. And Adam. I already highlighted Kate Otten from University of Washington as a guy that I really like. And I like him be because he's the complete opposite of Evan Ingram. And I, I don't mean that to disparage Evan Ingram, but I think we've all gotten frustrated with like seeing the talent that's off the charts, seeing a guy that has freak athleticism. And then like route running is an issue. Hands are an issue. Pass blocking is an issue. And all of a sudden we're left being like, well, what are we getting from the tight end room if we don't have any of that? It's, it's tricky, man. Um, you have to think back to like, it's like we, we talked about a lot before in the podcast, the Kevin bosses of the world, right? The guys that you, when you see him on tape, you go, eh, I don't know. There's really a lot there, but they do things in the blocking game. And then they're just consistent enough as a receiver to offer you some reliability in that vein. You know, you talk about can't take them early. You start to look back 67. I, again, I, I'm going to say that's too early for me. Kate Otten, where did, where did, where did they have him going? They have him going late third, early fourth round. So they right, have okay. him a little so, bit further back, which is so you can talk about 81. Why, I mean, you know, McBride, by the way, a, a, one of the top tight end prospects, he's not going to be on the board here for us friends. He's, he's going in the second round somewhere. So we're not highlighting him because we don't think that it's a viable option based on where the giants needs are. When you get back to 81, the, the couple of names that I'll throw out, I don't know if I mentioned this player before I had mentioned a deep cut that I'll still reiterate later quickly. Um, but Isaiah likely he's the guy to me that at a, you know, at a coastal Carolina, excuse me, like that has pretty close to the balance. The problem with him is that he's a little bit undersized six, four, two 41. He's a willing, but not necessarily great blocker. The profile for him is more as a receiver. So it goes a little bit against the grain of what you're speaking to the, the polar opposite, but he has the route running. He has the deep, play you know ability to have some opportunities in the receiving game third fourth round prospect you know he's average on draft buzz at 92 this is probably where again to the point about need and other and other areas on this roster if he falls to 112 i love i love running up and grabbing him feeling you know feeling good about it if that's the need that they're looking to address at 81 it's hard for me to look at that and not assume when you see draft boards and go there's going to be better prospects there at other positions that we need to fill yeah, and, and that's the problem is like when we feature all these different guys, McBride is just not on the Giants board. And I'd be shocked if the Giants took him in the second round and we probably would have a little egg on our face, Adam, for for not even you know highlighting him. But I just knowing the needs on this team and and I think likely is a, is, a, is a good guy in that third, fourth round you know selection. I think that's where the sweet spot is for this tight end room for the Giants. It's why we've highlighted Kate on it's why you you like likely. Um the one other guy that I really think could be, a, I think he could be a, a like an all pro star type of tight end that you can get in the third or fourth round. And yeah. his name is Cole Turner. Oh, and thank so, God. I thought you were going to say just uh, if we're just not uh, Jelani Woods is another guy in that range there um, who's big at six, seven, two fifty nine. Uh, but it's just the too tall, a little bit too tight hip. I know he's gotten some praise uh, leading up to this, but I thought I was like, I was a little bit concerned you were going to go that direction, but talk about Turner. No, no. So great. Adam, you and I agree wholeheartedly on Jelani Woods. So I am completely out on him. It, you know, everyone's basically saying, look at the year he had, look at the size he had. He's tremendous. And then you see, and you peel back the onion a little bit. 
he's almost 24 years old, right? He's been, he's been in college for five or six years. He spent three years at Oklahoma and didn't make an impact. He has one season of success at Virginia. And so the sample size is small. He's significantly older. And I don't know if his raw skills will ever fully translate knowing that he's already 24 years old, right? Like that to me, could just it says to me, I there's other guys in the draft that I'd rather go for, and that's why I like Cole Turner. So Cole Turner, 6'6", 246. He's a big-bodied guy. He's a tight end out of the University of Nevada. And Adam, you know, just for Giant fans to get really excited, he was a dual-sport athlete. He played basketball. So if you want to, like, if you always longed for guys like Antonio Gates or Here Jimmy Graham, and in every single telecast, are like, did you know? that they both played basketball at Virginia Tech and Kent State. Like, that's the type of guy that Cole Turner is. He has great athleticism. He had, I think he had 10, 10 or 11 touchdowns last year. That, you know, he's he's a good athlete with good length. He's not going to wow you with what he does, but he's got solid athleticism. And they say that he is an elite pass-blocking tight end. Now, in the run game, he he's a little bit you know higher up, and he can get pushed back a little bit. But having a guy that can stretch the field at the tight end position that is an elite pass blocker that you could put outside a rookie right tackle that you end up drafting in this draft, that's a good start to a young right side of the offensive line for both the run game and the pass game. Yeah, pretty consistent. Looks like he can be a decent deep threat as well. Do you have any concern over, ah, I was going to say average ADP, though. Um, you're talking about 163. Now, these numbers are weird when it comes to tight ends because of how the position is valued or devalued. But is that a very comfortable 112 selection, potential 147 for the Giants? Or do you think you have to get in there at 112? Well, I mean, there, NFL Draft Buzz and others have him a little bit higher up. They say he could be late third, early fourth, but then you look at other sites, they say he could be there at 150. So right. to me, I think the target is 112. I think that's the area. If the Giants use their fourth round pick on him, that means that basically they've addressed five other areas of need before going to tight end. And to me, that would be a success. If you got a 6'6", 250 elite pass blocking tight end, that, that is a huge red zone threat for the team. And you've already addressed all the other needs. Sign me up for that today, Adam. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, so we're both in the same kind of range. I think 112, that's late enough. And again, it's not that blocking isn't important, but it, this is all relative too. We've talked about the wide receiver position before. Have the Giants picked up another weapon on the offensive side before they go to address the tight end room? That's where I think it becomes interesting because then leaning into a guy that that models as being a block first tight end with some pass catching upside, that's great. But if you haven't gotten the wide receiver yet, then you start to look at these guys and say, how are we going to balance this room here? I'll just throw out. I don't know if you have another one quickly. I've mentioned him before. I, I just I want to make sure that I keep reiterating that I think that Derek Deese Jr. coming out of San Jose State, when you go and watch his tape, everything about him is great. Red zone threat, really soft, reliable hands. Talk about the antithesis of Evan Ingram. Just soft, reliable hands shows that he can go up in traffic. He's not these guys not a burner but he gets to his spots, has nice route running, and then he makes himself available for the quarterback and even in traffic comes down with that ball. And although they say he's okay developmental when you talk about being a, a blocker in line, at 6'4", 236, he's lean. But when you go and watch his tape, the thing about him is got has to start using his hands more in pass protection, in run blocking, but he uses his body. So he basically just takes all 236 pounds of himself and gets in front of people and just kind of uses himself as a human shield. It, it can be developmental. This is a guy you'll talk about 171 back end of the draft here. You know, double dipping at a position like tight end, very, very unlikely. But if other needs overtake the Giants as we work through 81 and 112, 147, then you can look at this player and say, hey, we can bring him in and maybe develop him in and alongside Ricky Seals Jones and say there, there's young talented upside here that could turn into a serviceable blocker. Yeah, it could, it could be that we start looking in the fifth and sixth round for these guys. If you know, other positions fall the, the way that the giants are hoping, you know, in, in that vein, you know, the Buffalo Bills selected Dawson Knox who didn't had, had limited tape, but sure. was not a very good blocker, but seemed to be a, a pretty good athlete that could catch the ball. The, a little bit different, but in, in the same vein is a guy that's getting drafted late is Charlie Kohler out of, out of Iowa state. 
He was a yeah. three-time All-American. He has elite hands. Like, when it gets thrown to him, the ball will be caught. And they say he is the safety blanket for basically any quarterback. And that could be helpful, you know, for someone like Daniel Jones, who every time he threw it to Evan Ingram, it felt like it was ricocheting and going in a different direction. So while his pass blocking and his run blocking are not his expertise, in the late rounds, if you're looking to get a security blanket or a pass catching tight end that you can develop like they have with Dawson Knox, I think that that Charlie Kohler of Iowa State is another guy. Look, in the fifth and the sixth round, as we get a little later into the draft, as a guy that I wouldn't be too upset if the Giants selected. Yeah, for some reason, I like the idea of if, if you show that you're capable of, of being a pretty consistent route runner and you have the hands for the position, I can get you there on being a serviceable blocker, right? And especially when you talk about the Dable system, only having one tight end and wanting to use them in a lot of different positions, being able to spread them out and just say, hey, we're going, we're going wide here. It's just going to be the offensive line helmet on helmet, and we need you to be able to run a seven-yard button hook route, catch that damn ball, and settle down to make it second and three. Let's then turn our attention, my friend, over to the running back position where, listen, coming into this, we know where I stood on the offseason. You and I battled back and forth on it a little bit around the value of Saquon Barkley, what should or should not be done. I, I, I can't say with 100% certainty that they're going to go through this entire year with Saquon Barkley in the backfield. However, we can only assess this position assuming that Saquon Barkley is going to be a part of the running back room heading into this year all the way through the season, regardless of what happens next offseason. In that vein, how do you look at this running back room knowing that they have a couple of youngsters, brought someone over from Buffalo, a holdover from last regime, and then also brought in a player like Matt Breida, where we also disagree on his value? Yeah, so it, it, the running back room is interesting. You and I disagree on on the direction that the Giants should take or potentially will take with, with Saquon Barkley. I obviously think he helps the development um, of Daniel Jones. It, Please stop being on the field. Daniel Jones. Please stop listing him as an asset to developing Daniel Jones. If Daniel Jones can't be a quarterback, it's over. Christ, with this. I mean, you just. You, I I know that you're frustrated about everyone talking about Daniel Jones, but it's okay. It's okay to have positivity and think that. Other players can make other players better, which is where I go with Saquon Barkley. But on the other side of things, when you talk about Matt Breida coming over from Buffalo, you know, has familiarity with, with Dayball and Joe Shane. Antonio Williams also signed to a future reserve contract, came over from Buffalo. It's nice that we have a couple of guys in the room that are already familiar with the system, can get acclimated very quickly. You know, Gary Brightwell is listed third on the depth chart. To be honest, he was a late-round flyer from a previous regime. I'd be shocked if he ends up making this roster. So for me, it looks like you kind of have three running backs that are in play, and you potentially could look to draft someone maybe in the third to fifth round um, to be able to shore up the rest of the running back room. Is that is that kind of where your head's at too, Adam? Yeah, it's funny, man. So because if you're going to go into the season with Saquon Barkley, and I believe I think that Matt Breida is, is a low-key, sneaky signing, by the Giants because he's incredibly talented going back to his San Francisco days. He was, he didn't have an opportunity really in Buffalo to showcase what his value is, but he's an all-around back. He has speed. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. So I really like him. If you're going in with those two players at the top, you already have a very solid tandem in your backfield. So it does start to make me think I got to push this back a little bit in the draft because it would, it would seem counterintuitive to go into some of the earlier rounds here and say, we're going to bring in a running back. Okay. Well, where does he fit in? Now he can get ahead of Brita, obviously, but was, is there a value? Is there a value fill there when you have a serviceable backup behind Saquon Barkley? And now you're going to throw a guy to the mix. That you certainly want to utilize. Are we doing a three headed monster in the backfield with Saquon Barkley, who, by the way, someone threw out a stat that he has the lowest yards per carry uh, in the NFL at the position over the last couple of seasons. No big deal though. We like that anyway. So it's, it's hard for me. Because then when you look inside the draft and you start to think about 67, 81, who's the name that people have thrown out in connection with and the Giants have brought in for an interview that surprised us both a little bit? Yeah, so for me, James Cook, the running back out of the University of Georgia, guy ran a 4 4 2 40. He's, a, he's a, an athlete that is just super quick and shifty. And there's nothing to not like about him when he's on the field. The, the, the problem for me, and the Giants brought him in, like you said, for one of the 30, you know, the thir top 30 visits. The issue is that he's probably going to go in the second round. And when we talk about all the other positional needs that we have stressed on this show, even like I can name five positions that we need to address before we need to address the running back room. 
you know, in the short term. Now, if you're saying we're going to be moving on from Saquon Barkley and we want to have a running back to kind of like get a year under his belt being, uh, you know, the number two in command. Sure. I can understand that. But man, if you tell me that you want to grab James Cook over, uh, you know, a, a linebacker that could start day one at middle linebacker and, and potentially replace Blake Martinez, that's where I have a hard time really understanding how we'd be in play for a running back in the second round. Well, if you want to read the tea leaves, you know, to me, then what that tells you is the, the, the door is not closed on Saquon's Barkley, Barkley's journey this off season, as far as wh what's going to potentially happen. Cause to your point, I can't see you drafting a James cook. If you're keeping Saquon Barkley, at least in the short term, because you can go into next year's draft and you can find another talented running back and on down the line, you can work and you'll have money next year. So who knows? You can spend a little bit of money on the right priced running back in free agency. Listen, James Cook is certainly a dynamic playmaking running back. We know he has family ties at the NFL level right now. Listen, draft buzz has him. You know, you said second round. They still have him like, you know, it's like 80 ish is the average. This is where I wonder. We've talked about positions and how value continues to show itself throughout the draft how high he goes becomes interesting to me because if we start to say i don't think he's there at 81 by any stretch is there any world where he's there at 67 i don't know it looks like he's gone from being an 80 ish to being closer to a 50 ish right if we're if we're talking about where he's gone and i think not unlike when we talked about christian watson I think that by the time we get to the draft, it ends up being where you're saying, right? Top 45, top 40 kind of pick right. where all of a sudden we go, I thought this dude was going to be a late second, you know, early third. And now here he is much higher. I, the curiosity to me would be if the Giants are bringing in a player like that, then I have to assume that they're willing to address that position earlier in the draft. And if you're going to do that, I'll throw out. Tyler Algieri out of BYU, the 4 6 40 time, 5 11, 220 pound back that really has the all around game for you. He's physical. He hits the gaps. He doesn't, he doesn't mince words with his feet, dancing around back there. He finds it and he goes. He's also a solid receiver, can get out into the flat, can be a pass catcher. He would be, by the way, we're talking about if you want a Saquon Barkley replacement, then this is a guy that you could draft again see where it falls here 67 81 i've seen mocks where he goes somewhere between 81 and 112 and that feels a little more a little more feasible i also think that again this is a player that by the time we get to the draft you're talking about him in the top 65 not the top 85 well adam i have a question for you does it concern you about his 40 time because for me the the knock on him is you know a force a four six two forty especially when you think about like milliseconds mattering in the NFL, like being able to hit the hole and, and take something to the house. Like to me that my biggest concern is just the, the top line speed and, and the speed that the NFL linebackers play at. You have a four, four, five, 40 linebacker chasing this guy down on, on, you know, on a power eye. And he, I just don't know if he has the, the speed. He does have the strength. I, I would agree with you there. Is there concerns for you about, about that, you know, just quickness overall? Yeah, my, my thing would be, again, if you're building towards the future, this is why you have Matt Breida on the roster. This is a guy that can work in tandem. You have a speedier, faster, out in, the, out in space kind of running back, smaller, and now you add in this more power bruising running back, a little bit of a tandem mentality. I mean, listen, I, I'm not making any comps here. Derrick Henry ran a 4 4 5 40. You know, we talk about it, right? You, you said it at some of these other positions that we've highlighted. I want a football player, right? So not all the measurables matter. When you watch him play, he looks good. He's getting the job done. Now, can four and a half yard pickups become three and a half because he doesn't quite have that little extra burst? Or can 15 yard runs like we saw a lot when Saquon was out, right? With all the other guys they ran through over the last couple of years. Oh, get caught from behind after 12 yards instead of it being a 35 yard, a 40 yard to the house touchdown. So th th those are the little things here. And also, by the way, I like him as a prospect. But this is probably why you say Cook is worth it because he's that electric player that you can go go to the house with on any individual play. And if not, if they don't check all these little boxes, then you have to start moving back towards 112 and later looking for some value picks for the Giants. I'd be curious. That's something that we should look at is uh, NFL running backs that run a over a 4-6-40 in their success because you look at guys like Jonathan Taylor, who's like a track star, a burner. Even Derrick Henry for his size ran a 4-4-5. Right. Like, and that's and again, unicorn, faster. right? Yeah, yeah that's, it's insane. And in that vein, there's someone that I like that has that speed and okay. yeah, he has that strength. And ironically, his name is Pierre Strong uh, Jr. out of South Dakota State. I looked at have, him. Do like him. Do like him. I, I, if you haven't, 
watched any film on him or haven't seen what he is. He's 5'11", 200 pounds. He runs strong. He's got perfect size for the running back position. 43740. The guy is fast. He's strong, he's fast, and he has a track record of success. The big knock is, albeit it's in the FCS, right? So he hasn't gone against the highest level of competition, but when he's out there playing, he is scoring touchdowns. Like in 2021, he had almost 1,500 yards and 16 touchdowns. They gave him the ball. He kept delivering time in, time out. He's the type of guy that if you complimented him with Saquon Barkley in the room, you know, he he would be a perfect fit, has speed, excellent athleticism, and is and and just can be a dynamic playmaker for the Giants. So for me, that's the type of guy going in the fourth round right now that the Giants could wait a couple of rounds later than the second round to address a, a need and still get a high-quality impact player. So here's the funny thing, because I'm going to bring up a guy who, and they've talked about, same kind of thing, this fourth-round kind of area, um, and no higher than the fourth round. So I'm looking at like 112 could maybe be the sweet spot to get a player like this. But you just mentioned about like a great compliment to Saquon Barkley, someone with speed and both. The compliment to Saquon Barkley is power and brute force because that's what Saquon Barkley isn't. Like they need someone that's going to grind out tough yards is what we saw last year, right? When you look at a elite talent like Saquon Barkley and that scrub they brought in and signed that you hated the contract for, which I get, but he went ahead and had more yards per carry over the course of the season because he was able to stay between the tackles and get the dirty work done. In that vein, when you look inside this draft class, man, go ahead. What, what, oh, you got something? Or are you are you just teeing I, me up here? I, I think I know who you're gonna who you're gonna say, and that's the other person that I have teed up. So hit me with it, Adam. Oh, no, good. No, okay, go say it. Let's see it. Let's see if you're right. So my other guy, if you're looking a little bit later, fifth round, moving forward, a guy that can move the chains, power run guy delivered on the big stage i'm talking hassan haskins michigan running back another very good running back he's not my guy i'll let you highlight him in a second there's other players like a tyler goodson later in this one no i am talking about letty brown out of west virginia mm. who again mm. let's get into those numbers because 40 time of a 464 does not have the speed and burst that maybe you're looking for however I'm going to give you what I think was really a great summary on his scouting report over on Draft Buzz. He'll benefit from being part of a running back class that's somewhat underwhelming this year, has great size to be an every down back at the NFL, and is well-versed as a receiver and as a blocker in the backfield, so he offers versatility, not to mention he has excellent injury history, which you can't underestimate the importance of for running back to the NFL and thus is likely to have a solid NFL career, probably as a part of a running back rotation scheme. If you're talking about bringing somebody in, Saquon Barkley is going to be there. Rita's going to be there this year. If you bring in a guy like Brown, this is the thumper. This is the dude that comes in and churns out yards for you. And by the way, on those passing downs, does something that Saquon Barkley to this point in his career, and you can't assume he's going to develop it, is not very good at, that is pass protection. Saquon Barkley has missed on, whiffed on, not gotten his eyes across to the other side of the line to pick up the blitzes coming off the edge. Letty Brown can be a guy that helps protect Daniel Jones or any future quarterback while also offering power and strength between the tackles. I, I do I do like that pick. I think I focus more on Hassan Haskins, one, because he did it on a little bit of a bigger stage. Michigan, all they wanted to do was run the ball. That's all they wanted to do. Every single team knew that Michigan was going to run it down your throats this year. And Hassan Haskins delivered. He had 20 touchdowns. The guy was an absolute I like him. Beast. I like him a lot. Be bell cow for, for Michigan. And he's he's the idea. Like, if you were to carve out what a running back should look like, 6 to 1, 2 to 20, muscular, downhill runner, breaks tackles, and has improved every year as a run and pass blocker. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, he's a perfect rotational piece. You have the home run hitter in Saquon Barkley when healthy, and when you need three yards, when you need four yards, and you need to run the ball right down someone's throat, Hassan Haskins is the guy for me. And, and so that's why I've been focusing so much on him. Teams knew that he was getting the ball, and he was still averaging five yards a carry. And he was doing it against big-time opponents. And for me, that says a lot about the type of player he is because he's going to see that every day in the NFL. 
So then, then the question becomes, because I do, I like him a lot, and I looked at him right there, and you can see, especially when you get later in the, in, the, in the draft here, I'm talking about pass blocking, being a solid player, and you look at the ratings on Haskins, it is fantastic about what he can do for you in the backfield as a runner and as a pass protector. Four five eight forty, by the way, too, so he's running it faster than some of the guys that, that we've highlighted today, so even though he's a bruiser, he still has a little bit of that quickness. And by the way, on Letty Brown, they said, you know, doesn't have doesn't have necessarily that second gear to get to yet has never been caught from behind when you watch him on Ooh. tape. So does enough to get away. Right. There's I like that. That sounds, fast, that sounds like agent. That sounds like agent speak. Right. You're like, I know he's not fast, but no one ever caught him. So like oh, you don't have it on there's tape. No, there's, there's no proof. Fall speed. There's no proof that he's that yeah, yeah. slow. Like, uh, I know the stopwatch says it, but watch the film. There's not a guy that's tackled him by his ankles. Okay. Show me a time. Show me a time. A guy tackled from behind. Just show it to me. That's you go, amazing. well, listen, I we looked at the that. video. We're not entirely, just show me. If you can't show me, then he must be fast. The bottom line is the, the interesting thing for me would be Haskins, a little bit of, a, a bit of a higher profile coming into this draft. When it says fourth, fifth round, right? So when we talk about 112, then you start to go back a little bit further. 147 is your next opportunity. And we'll do even a little bit deeper dive. But at that point, by the way, the one other name that I'll just quickly throw out here uh, that I had listed up, and that's going to be Master Teague out of Ohio State. I think he's a solid prospect. But whether or not he's even drafted seven, sixth, seventh, or going into undrafted free agency potentially, so that that could be where the Giants look to go here too. The only question I have is like fourth, fifth. Well, what if that starts to become closer to a hundred than one twelve? What if it becomes closer? To, you know, all of a sudden, if that name, to your point, depending on how Cook goes and depending on how some of these other higher profile backs go earlier in the draft, the secondary run on the position can all of a sudden get chopped up just a little bit higher. So that's what's going to be fascinating to see here. And if it does. This is where I, I think, as the Giants stand right now, we can go ahead and say at the end of the day, if they don't, if they don't see the group falling to them, they're not chasing this, right? They're not going to be at 81 and go, boy, I see a run coming here on running back. We better grab our guy. It's going to be, let's talk about 147. Let's talk about 171. Let's talk about undrafted free agents. And let's talk about the guys that we have in our room. I think as it stands today, more likely than anything is that we don't see them take anyone until well into some of the later rounds of the draft here, if at all, because they do have four backs, a couple of young guys, a consistent veteran backup and Saquon Barkley for whatever his value is. It'll be a very, very curious to see where Joe, Joe Shane and Dable go here because it's going to be indicative of what they think in the short term, even about Saquon Barkley. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, Adam, the New York football giants have nine, I think it's nine picks in this draft. Um, and, and I can name you at least five or six different areas that the giants need to go to before addressing the running back room. So for, so for me, I'm thinking like we got to address starters rather than secondary or tertiary guys that are going to back up Matt Breida or are a bridge to Saquon Barkley in a year or two. So, so for me, that's why I think it's important I, if these guys start creeping up like Haskins could, then you kind of got to say, I, I like you. I'm not in love with you. And we have other areas of need that we need to address. Keep your eyes open for that draft day trade of Saquon Barkley, which would open up the viability of bringing in a player like Cook for a top 30 interview. Very interesting to see how it all shakes out, my friends. That'll wrap up another multiple position breakdown that we did here today. You get over to YouTube, you check out the videos, you subscribe, you like it, you get the podcast where those needs get fulfilled. We're going to get right back into it. We, we still have the big hitters of offensive line, edge rusher, cornerback. We got to see where we're going there. There's so much talent as we were seeing here. The question is, how do you maximize the positional value at each point along the way for this draft class? We'll continue to break things down. Big guests coming up next week as well. You're going to want to be here for. And as Andy Makowitz would want, need, and always demand the people know. As always, let's go big blue. 